Good evening, and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dina Kleba, founder and CEO of Insight Counseling Duluth. I am your host for our program tonight on mental health for couples and families. The success of this program is very dependent on you, the viewer, so please call in your questions tonight or send them to our email address, ask at pbsnorth.org. The telephone numbers can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening include Jamie Milbred Scott of Bridge Family Therapy, Mary Casey Ladd of Duluth Family Therapy, and Dr. Corey Duffy, licensed psychologist of Rooted Psychology. Answering the phones tonight are members of the PBS staff. And now on to tonight's program on mental health for couples and families. The first time we're having this conversation, um, I believe, and I'm super excited about it. Um, I think, and for sure, Mary, all of you, but under the umbrella of psychotherapy, mm -hmm. supporting couples and families is newer. It's one of the newer ones. It was, I mean, the focus was individual, and now we're inviting partners and families into the space, so it's, it's exciting. <laughs> and I, I was reflecting on how helpful it is too if we're able to support them sooner rather than later. So I'm so glad we're having this conversation. I remember reading a statistic, it's dated, but I would say even my anecdotal experience would, would concur that uh, couples, for instance, can wait six to seven years to seek help after an issue has kind of become an issue. Uh, so I'm really excited that we're having this conversation to be able to kind of talk about what support is available and, and how to get it. And last, I'll say that I've noticed, it seemed, I was just last year starting to get more training and kind of helping those couples who are on the brink of divorce. And the moment I started doing some more intentional training, all of a sudden now I'm seeing so many couples mm -hmm. that that's not the case. They're um, you know, raising young children mm -hmm. and maybe seeing them, their lives going on separate trajectories or their recent empty nesters or soon to be. So uh, they're very much in love and just kind of looking for well, we'll say the handbook, the manual, <laughs> which we're not, you know, we, I don't know, I always say like, we didn't, I didn't get a manual when I got married. You know, you have the one that you were raised with and, and they're beautiful and imperfect. And um, so yes, let's, let's start this conversation. There's so much that we were talking about um, in the green room. So <laughs> I don't know how we're gonna do this in 30 minutes. To start, let's, I mean, blended families, Couples who have divorced, um, how how do what do you, what are your recommendations about how to um, Jamie? Can we start with you as far as co-parenting? I mean, kind of under all of that. Yeah, well, I think I would start with um, as a parent, get your own help and support so that you have somebody that you can talk to, because the best outcomes for the children are when the parents get along well, and they don't hear their parents bad mouthing them or talking about them and and leaving the adult problems to the adults and not involving the children. Thank you. Mary, could you? Well, and I think exactly what Jamie is saying is so important is that um, as somebody trained in family therapy that what we were taught to really have an understanding about is um, watching how oftentimes children get caught in the marital conflict. And, um, and then children oftentimes will will act out some of that pain that they're absorbing. And so um, being very intentional, both for couples who are still together, to, um, to just really um, watch how, sometimes the children will try to triangulate and get in the middle, mm -hmm. and how important it is um, to be intentional as parents about not allowing that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and especially, I think, in, in families where there's contentious divorce, that is yeah. really, really a high risk factor for kids. It is. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Corey, anything? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, what we really know is that it's not divorce that causes poor outcomes for kids, it's conflict conflictual relationships between the parents. And that's true whether they're married or divorced. Mm -hmm. And so we know that if, the, the best thing that you can do as parents for your kids is to work on your own relationships, which of course means working on yourself, working on your own emotional regulation so that you can engage with, with anybody in a really healthy way. Love that, thank you. Corey, 
just with that too, uh, what would you say that you're seeing, and, and I believe you see primarily couples, mm -hmm. um, less families, so what are some of the, the issues, some of the presentations that they're bringing in today? Well, I'll tell you the main thing that I hear when people are coming into couples counseling is that they need to work on their communication. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that that is a really actually very powerful statement because communication is that space in between where we are figuring out how to negotiate our relationship with other people. And so, you know, they're not wrong that they do need to work on their communication. But what I always tell people is we have to take a step back because before we can communicate with somebody else, we really need to understand what's happening for our own selves. And we really need to be able to, you know, turn down the volume on that emotional dysregulation in order to be able to know what we think and then be able to communicate it effectively. Appreciate that. And that space being safe. Yes. Right? That felt sense of safety to be able to to do that and I just I mean we're biologically hardwired to also be you know survival instinct and and have some protective factors which thank goodness mm -hmm. however they can become problematic in the adult relationships when we haven't you know, spent some time around, some insight around what's happening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary, how about you? How would you say you've been supporting couples and families lately? What have you been noticing? <coughs> the, um, in the 70s, when I was under training, one of my supervisors said to me, the worst phrase that we've heard in our culture is the phrase of, I have to tell you how I feel. And when I, when I heard him say that, I thought, what, you know, Sam, what are you talking about? And he said, people say that when they're now what we call flooded, when they're emotionally um, really charged, not in their wise mind, but in a really reactive part of their brain. And it is a time when people can say just the cruelest and meanest things to each other. So I think that it is very difficult when people are in that angry state who want to be heard and want their point to get across, um, that they have to recognize that there's a time when you need to be able to take a break, step away, which is very, very difficult for us to do when we're in it, to step away, to cool down, and to be able to re-engage in a way, as you said, Dina, when it feels emotionally safe. Right. Yeah, that uh, being trained by the Gottmans, you know, they say mm -hmm. they even put a little monitor on the fingers to monitor mm -hmm. heart rate, right? And mm -hmm. if it goes above 80, then we're going to be soothing. Yeah, because mm -hmm. <laughs> nothing productive happens, That's right? right. You're, um, yeah, executive functioning is, is challenged. Yeah, how about you, Jamie? Well, what are you seeing? Yeah. <laughs> we talked about, you've got some, you, yeah, please talk yeah, about well, that. Yeah, well, so there's a lot of things that, that bring people in, but um, I think both of these ladies have spoken to um, just how the big emotions come, right? And we don't always recognize why they're there, but they come and they come out looking like anger. But underneath all of that is hurt, disappointment, pain, all kinds of things. Um, and so I'm helping couples get to the root, right? Some of those deeper emotions and meanings that we make of um, what our partners do. Like if your partner leaves the pizza on the counter, what does that mean? And, and how they're interpreting that is they think I'm their maid and they're disrespecting me. They don't care about me. And really, yes, right. And they go right to that instead of he got busy and he left the pizza on the counter, right? And it's not about the pizza, it's about what's going on at a deeper level. And then, and then it gets into this cycle of conflict, right? And you were talking about dysregulation with all those, those heavy emotions coming, we have to learn how to regulate. And Bruce Perry, he's just phenomenal, his work, but he talks about how when we're dysregulated, we're back here in the back of our brain, you know, and we're not doing any thinking back there. We're doing the surviving, like you said, the reacting to things because we're wired to survive. Mm -hmm. Then up here is where we can relate. And then in the front is where our skills lie for the thinking and everything. So before we can learn to communicate with the skills, we have to be able to regulate our bodies first and then relate and then reason. Thank you. Um, and I think, yeah, I'd love to talk a little bit about some of the ways that we do it. Or if you could just pick one modality that you've been using lately. Um, and I'm going to call on the PCI parent-child 
interaction. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so my work with um, parents is just a little bit about it is um, it's called parent-child interaction therapy. I teach parents how to do play therapy with their children so that they are building the relationship mm -hmm. with their child instead mm -hmm. of me. I do it through the internet so I get to see them at home and they're in their natural environment. So sometimes they know I'm there and but they forget that I'm there when they're playing with their parents. And then I coach the parent in, the, in an earbud in their ear as they're playing. And I'm reinforcing these beautiful therapeutic techniques. And so what you see in the first phase of treatment is behaviors just dramatically going down because parents have to then practice five minutes a day, just five minutes a day, those skills. And it changes kids' behaviors and it creates this warm, beautiful attachment. And if you're already ha having this warm, beautiful attachment, it enhances it even more. And in the second phase of treatment, we then teach the parents, now that you've calmed him, now that you've grown closer, now what do you do when he doesn't listen? Or what, she, what do you do when she doesn't listen? And we teach you what to do exactly all these steps. It, it takes the guesswork out of it. And it helps parents to, it empowers them really to be the parents they want to be instead of the parents that we become when we're overwhelmed and we're stressed and we have nothing left to give. Right, right. all of us, human. Yeah. yeah. And the important thing, Jamie, about what you're doing, which is very different for a lot of people who were trained to do children's therapy, is that you're more in the background as the parent's coach mm -hmm. and that the, the focus isn't on the child forming a relationship with you, but you helping the parents reestablish the trusting relationship with the child. And, um, and there are so many child therapists in my, um, in my experience who don't, it's like they have not been trained to involve the parents mm -hmm. in the therapy. They consult with them before the session or after the session, but that focus about that, that your job is to help that parent and that child strengthen that bond, which needs to continue after the therapy's done. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, if you're just tuning in, we're having a, a great conversation on mental health for couples and families. Uh, Mary, a favorite modality, and you've taught me so much over the oh, years. It's like an, Which one would you pick? No, it's like, I, I, and you won't be surprised, Dina, to hear me say that I can't say that I have a favorite because um, I, when I, I started training in 1972 as a family therapist, and the field has changed and evolved so much over those years. And, um, and so it, it is, you know, for me, it's about being able to have the exposure to some incredible clinicians and theorists and, mm -hmm. um, and to kind of adapt and borrow so much. Mm -hmm. I would say that one of the most powerful for me was the training that I got in what was called narrative therapy. Mm -hmm. And that we were having an understanding about like, what are the stories that have been passed on generationally what are the stories that we tell about why our kid is misbehaving? You know, it's like one family, it was like they were dropped on their head as an infant. And, you know, and the family came to believe that is a truth. And so to be able to kind of say, well, that's a possibility, but let's look at some other factors that might go, um, go into this. So this, this ability to listen to what the stories are that sometimes restrict the families from being able to see, you know, their possibilities or their potential, I think is um, that that training was very, very um, impactful and significant. And, and I couldn't, I can then hear as we were talking about, as we started, that the meaning that somebody attaches or the story that they have in their head mm -hmm. about why somebody is doing whatever to me or to other people um, again, it's a possibility, it's not a fact. And so we wanna, we wanna create the ability to kind of step back and look at how is it that you came to believe this about your child or about your spouse? Um, what are the factors that kind of led to that? And, um, and let's maybe get a different angle on that. Great, so that was you. powerful for me. Yeah. Corey, how about you? What have you been doing lately? Yeah. Well, so I, this is not so much a modality, but the, the skill probably that I fall back on the most when I'm working with couples 
is a skill that's taught pretty much in any type of couples therapy training you will take, but then I think it's always called something different. So I call it mirroring, which I got from Harville Hendricks. Um, but basically what it is, it's very similar to what you're describing with the parent-child interaction where you're teaching the parent to interact with the child. In mirroring, I'm teaching the couples to interact with each other, right? right. So that I'm not having to talk to each of them so much. <laughs> But so what it is is basically somebody, one person, the speaker, says the thing that they want to say to their partner. The partner says it back to them, almost word for word. They're not interpreting, they're not putting their own spin on it, they're not sharing their opinion about it or anything like that, right? They're just saying it back. And then the speaker gets to confirm or deny, like, okay, is this what I thought, what I meant to say or not? Do they get it? So they can add a little bit to it if they want to. They can clarify for the, for the partner. The partner then mm -hmm. reconfirms. So you go through this cycle as many times as necessary until the speaker feels understood. Mm -hmm. And that's the metric for whether it's working or not, as the speaker says, yes, you got it, I feel understood now. And what that does for the space between a couple is so powerful because then all of a sudden everybody relaxes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's like, okay, now we can get somewhere. But it's, it's so simple, but it's not easy at all. Mm -hmm. And so it does take a lot of practice, but I, I find that to be, if I could teach couples one skill, that would be it. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been imago therapy, you know, mm -hmm. developed by him. And uh, I mean, and it's putting the chairs together so couples are knee to knee if you have them in the office with you. And sometimes, I mean, it's, it sounds so simple, right? Mm -hmm. And easy, but even like couples facing each other sometimes, that might not happen at all. Like I'll, I'll get the giggles, you know? And I mean, it's just, it's amazing and powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, I will add that part of that um, dialogue, you know, with the mirroring, making an appointment. Mm -hmm. I have found that to be the gem <laughs> in some of those steps. I mean, sure. just because often when we want to comment about the pizza on the couch, you know, it's like things are just moving fast or whatever. And to truly be able to hold that space, I just, I've found so many times like ha with couples and I'll just say myself personally asking, is now a good time to share? Um, my most recent one was, I don't feel like it's safe to go on the lake when it's so warm out. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> For sure. And I mean, you know, but For of sure. course it's fine and For exit, sure. but it's like, it's helpful mm -hmm. to make an appointment. For something just very trivial, but I think we all know some of those just trivial things can become <laughs> well, complex conversations w when an emotion or mm -hmm. a raw spot gets hit. And making the appointment to come to couple sessions is sometimes the first date that couples have had for a very, very long time. I have goosebumps, Mary, when you say that. No, I How mean, many, they will go out to dinner or yes. happy hour or something afterwards and they hadn't done that. For a long time. Because the marriage oftentimes gets put on the back burner when the first yeah. child is born. It's really busy. Right. And I want to say again, because I mentioned uh, the, and look, the empty nest, so on and so forth. And I've recently heard the term free birds. And I like that too. Yeah. <laughs> and I've noticed the couples I'm working with like that too. We're free birds, you know, still transition, mm -hmm. ups and downs or whatever, but that was kind of a fun way to talk about it. So we have uh, Karen from Washburn, Wisconsin as a question. She says, how do, how do I handle anxious thoughts and ruminations when they come to me at 4 a.m.? She doesn't necessarily mention couples, but I can't help but think that often we are sharing a bed <laughs> sometimes with someone at 4 a.m. And um, so just if we can kind of look at it from that perspective as well, how to support each other when we're experiencing anxiety, which one of the other questions is about um, a partner losing his best friend and mm -hmm. um, uh, how do I support him? So I guess when you know your partner's experiencing, whether they're ruminating at night or there's been a loss, what do you think, um, Corey, if you want to start, what feels like most helpful or some some things that they could try sure well I think you know with the anxious thoughts that's obviously very common right like people will awaken in the middle of the night with anxiety right and that they can't fall back to sleep because it's it's uh you know hard to fall asleep when your mind's racing but I think that um, self-soothing is going to be the key but the mm -hmm. trick is how to find something that actually mm -hmm. feels like that for you so it's going to be a really individual process i think that um, one thing that 
I think is kind of helpful for people is to think that sometimes it's hard to go straight to the self-soothing piece. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need to distract ourselves first from the thing that's stressing us out. Mm -hmm. And so like in bed at night, in the middle of the night, right? Like maybe popping in a podcast that's a little bit boring, but something that's gonna just get your mind off of it. So something that can distract you first and then you can kind of refocus on how do I like do some deep breathing? How can I, um, you know, try to get my, to my, my body to be more comfortable? And the other thing that we know about sleep, which I'll talk about sleep all day because to me it's the most important piece. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> if you are finding yourself laying in bed for more than 20 minutes or so, you want to get up out of that bed because mm -hmm. otherwise your bed's going to become associated with all these anxious mm -hmm. thoughts rather mm -hmm. than sleeping and resting. So mm -hmm. just get up, walk around, get yourself a glass of water, whatever it is. So something like that. I mean, yeah, when it comes to supporting your partner about these things, I think, you know, for the most part, just being a listening space for them, right? I mean, f you know, usually when people ha are having a problem, whether it's anxiety or whether it's losing a friend, like there's nothing that you can do about it. And so th your partner's not coming to you wanting you to solve the problem. Your partner's coming to you just because they want to again, feel heard and understood. And so just being able to offer that space, oh, I think, is such a gift. Even grabbing, holding your hand mm -hmm. yeah, in bed. That's mm -hmm. goes, that's mm -hmm. beautiful. Um, anything else as far as supporting uh, Jamie or Mary? Did you want to weigh in at well, all? I, I agree wholeheartedly with that most people just need support when they're in grief, and support looks different for everybody. And so you have to learn what your partner needs. And it could be a hand holding, it could be a, I want you to know that I care and I'm here. I don't know what to say because there isn't anything we can say, right? Um, and then on the anxious thoughts one in the middle of the night, one of my favorite things that I have my clients do is keep a notebook and paper, um, pen next to the bed, have them write it down really quick because then the brain can say, oh, okay, I'll remember this tomorrow. And then it can shut back off and go back to sleep. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but that's why you wanna have a bunch of tools in your toolbox. And I've done that and it's amazing how those are not important really <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> that list. Um, Mary. What rituals can I develop with my partner to inspire our relationship? Oh my goodness, this is, um, there's a, a wonderful resource for this is Evan Amber Black wrote a book called Rituals for Our Families. And, and it's filled with fantastic rituals that, um, that can help. But I think that, you know, the rituals that are important to develop have to do with what some of your shared interests are. Some couples I work with, they have a ritual of, of leaving a note on the, the day, you know, like on the 30th of every month, which is a day that they met, um, which is a little love note. Or a ritual um, of a couple friends of mine who had been married m for um, over 50 years. On their anniversary, they went up to Grand Marais, they stayed in the same hotel, and they had written a letter to each other about reflections on this past year. Um, there are you know, rituals that have to do with how is it that we play together? So are there games, activities, um, or every month going and finding the full moon? I mean, so it again, it's like the ritual is um, an act, you know, a kind of like a shared belief that really gives meaning to the fact that sharing this with you is different than I just go and look at the, the full moon by myself, um, or that I listen to this piece of music. Um, and so there are, there are ways to have rituals that we, where we're celebrating things that are happening in our life, but I think for couples it is to emphasize how is it that we stay connected I'm in dialogue ri right now with um, um, two young dancers who are opening up their own studio, not in our state. And you know, we're, I'm consulting with them about how to use dance as that activity that can bring couples together, that it can be intimate, it can be romantic. I say sometimes dance is the best form of foreplay. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I think to, for couples, to, um, to just really devote some time in reflecting on, on what brings us together that feels like it's shared joy. Thank you. 
Jamie, one tip about how to connect? Oh, my, my favorite is make sure that you have time set aside every week. So if it's a weekly date or it's those ri rituals, they can be daily, but you have to be setting aside time to connect. And my favorite is weekly dates. Yeah. Corey, how about you? What's well, what's coming to my mind is just that the, um, what we know about the body's physical reaction to hugs. <laughs> and so, you know, we need to have, it needs to be about 30 seconds for our bodies to get that really powerful release of hormones that's like helps us to feel better. And so this is applicable for your partner, but it's also good for your kids too, right? To know that if we can get um, some nice long hugs in there, <laughs> we're all gonna feel a lot better. 30 second hugs and six second kisses. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank, I want to thank our panel of, um, our panelists, Jamie Milbridge Scott, Mary Casey Ladd, and Dr. Corey Duffy. Please join Dr. Ray Christensen next week for our program on upper GI problems. Thank you again for watching. Good night. <laughs>